Hello friends, this is Dr. Sayyid Nayyar Reza Kasmi and today I'm going to talk about pediatric constipation. So let's start with the background. Uh, constipation is uh, one of the most uh, common causes of uh, abdominal pain. It's considered to be the most uh, common medical cause of uh, uh, acute as well as chronic uh, abdominal pain in children of all ages. So it's very common across the whole spectrum of pediatric age group. Uh, it is responsible for around uh, 5 to 10 percent of visits to accidents and emergency departments as well as visits to the primary care. There is no uh, single standard definition and it is defined in many ways. Different textbooks have given different uh, definitions of constipation. Uh, some consider it to be uh, less frequent bowel movements and they say less than three bowel movements per week is constipation. Some books have described it as painful uh, passage of infrequent and hard uh, fecal matter. Some books uh, actually define it as abnormally delayed or infrequent passage of dry and hard stools. While uh, some books consider it to be a syndrome basically and it's a syndrome which is characterized by slow intestinal movements because of any reason which is then associated with uh, retention of uh, fecal matter which becomes hard in the large bowel and leads to constipation. Uh, let's start with the etiology, the causes of uh, constipation. Now, the most important are the lifestyle factors which are responsible for constipation in the pediatric age group. Uh, the most important thing is diet. Now, diet uh, which is low in fiber, uh, like uh, junk food, uh, like fast food, uh, coupled with the less intake of fluids, uh, a consumption of more coffee and tea uh, as usually happens by some adolescents and uh, uh, lax exercise and immobility which is sometimes associated with uh, some uh, chronic uh, neurological conditions like kids who are bedridden they eventually uh, have constipation as a problem. Now another uh, uh, classification of uh, constipation is uh, what we call as primary constipation and primary constipation is then further divided into three types the normal transit constipation the slow transit constipation and the pelvic floor dysfunction now the normal transit constipation is basically a constipation uh, which occurs because the child goes less frequently to the toilet the bowels themselves are normal there is no pathology inside the intestines the bowel movements are also fine so the transit time uh, for the food matter in the small as well as the large intestine is normal but because the child has got a sedentary lifestyle, he is not that much, uh, he, either he's not properly toilet trained or he has got fear of going to the toilet. So what happens is that uh, there is a, a less uh, defecation that leads to constipation. The slow transit constipation uh, is the condition in which the intestinal motility is slowed down. And uh, what happens is that because of this delayed uh, uh, transit time, in the intestine the stools become quite hard and this type of constipation is usually associated with a lot of straining so the child has to strain very hard and sometimes they can end up in anal fissures if it goes chronic over a period of time it can also lead to a complication known as hemorrhoids uh, but nevertheless this type of association uh, this type of constipation is associated with a lot of straining then the third or rare type is the pelvic floor dysfunction uh, mostly occurs in pelvic floor pathologies uh, neuromuscular conditions in which the pelvic floor muscles are very weak they are not able to contract properly so they are not able to aid in the defecation process so the child cannot completely evacuate his bowel so uh, he might be able to get rid of some of these stool but most of the stool remains inside then then becomes hard and leads to constipation the third important uh, reason for uh, constipation is different is use of different types of medication and some of the medications which are notorious for causing constipation uh, are opioids like use of morphine leads to constipation some of the diuretic medications like furosemide also leads to constipation use of antidepressant medication especially the anti uh, cholinergic variety of antidepressants like uh, amitriptyline Mipramine, uh, they've got anticholinergic side effects and that leads to constipation. Use of antispasmodic medications like hyoscine, bascopan can lead to uh, constipation. Some of the anti epileptic medications like valproic acid, uh, 
carbamazepine, phenytoin, they can also lead to constipation. Use of calcium channel blockers, which are usually uh, used in, uh, form, uh, in, in some forms of hypertension, though not that much common in uh, pediatric age group, it's more, their use is more common in the adults, they are uh, notorious for causing constipation as a side effect, uh, like diltiazem, amlodipine, etc, etc. Other reasons for uh, causing constipation are metabolic reasons. Uh, increased calcium in the blood. This could be because of uh, different reasons like hyperparathyroidism, sarcoidosis, uh, that can cause constipation. Diabetes mellitus uh, because of its autonomic uh, intestinal and, and like, you know, auto, auto, autonomic dysfunction uh, can lead to constipation. Cystic fibrosis is associated with uh, meconium ileus and constipation in later life. Uh, celiac disease, though normally presents with uh, diarrhea and malabsorption, uh, sometimes it can also present with uh, constipation. Hypothyroidism uh, can also present with constipation. Neurological and uh, neuromuscular conditions like uh, cerebral palsy, neurodegenerative disorders like uh, adreno uh, leukodystrophy, metachromatic leukodystrophy, they can cause constipation. Spinal cord pathologies like uh, meningomyelocele, uh, tuberous sclerosis, they can cause uh, constipation. Uh, absence of uh, myenteric uh, gangly ganglionic cells uh, like what happens in uh, distal uh, rectum in, uh, in heart spring disease, that causes constipation and the congenital muscular dystrophy can also cause constipation. Irritable bowel syndrome, which is a diagnosis of exclusion, uh, usually presents with bouts of constipation alternating with diarrhea. Some of the pathologies which cause obstruction uh, in the large intestine because of uh, pressure on the, on, on the large intestine, like some of the uh, abdominal or pelvic wall tumors or intra-abdominal organ hypertrophies, or, or, or carcinomas uh, like a Wilms tumor, uh, like a neuroblastoma, they can put pressure on the large intestine and can cause constipation. Uh, psychiatric condition can also cause constipation. Uh, some of them are uh, fear of pain. Some of the kids who have developed anal fissure or got hemorrhoids, they've got a fear of uh, going to the toilet because they think that they will have blood or they will have pain. So they try to hold on to their call of nature and that further aggravates the constipation. Uh, some kids have got uh, fear of going to the public toilets because they think uh, they think it's scary, they think it's dirty, so they will hold on to their uh, nature's call and that will lead to constipation. And some kids are just lazy, uh, they would be just watching uh, their favorite TV shows, uh, playing uh, games on the Xbox or on the computer and simply they don't want to go to the toilet so they ultimately end up in uh, constipation. Uh, the diagnosis is based on a history of physical examination because essentially it is a clinical diagnosis. So sometimes we do x-rays uh, especially if a child presents with abdominal pain and the x-ray is done to rule out any air fluid levels. Um, you can see that the child has got uh, hard fecal matter uh, which is uh, loaded inside the uh, large intestine and that helps in the diagnosis but nevertheless in history you should ask about the frequency of uh, going to the toilet uh, passage of any hard stools uh, painful heart defecation uh, you have to ask about any bloating distension of the abdomen uh, you have to ask about abdominal pain and um, headaches uh, which uh, are quite common in constipation some of the kids have got fatigue uh, with chronic constipation you should also ask about diet because dietary factors are very much responsible for constipation and uh, it's very uh, it's also very important to ask about uh, the uh, passage of meconium in the first 48 hours because kids who were not able to pass meconium in the first 48 hours and passed after that you have to think about his sprung disease uh, because his sprung disease can also present in later life in physical examination, the first thing is to look for any evidence of soiling. Encopresis is quite common in kids who are uh, chronically constipated. Uh, you should also palpate the abdomen. In chronic constipation, you can feel uh, soft, firm, uh, fecal masses. They're more uh, palpable on the left side of the, uh, of the tummy. Sometimes you can also feel it on the right side of the abdomen as well. 
You should also do a rectal examination to look for any associated features like anal fissure, uh, hemorrhoids, and you should also check for sphincter tone because if the sphincter tone is decreased, you should think about uh, neurological uh, spinal cord pathologies. Spine examination is also important uh, for, for any child who present with constipation. Like for example, if you see a tuft of hairs on the spine or a sectoral dimple, then you should think of uh, distal spinal cord pathologies. Uh, some of the red flags uh, which should never be missed with constipation are history of weight loss, uh, bleeding and anemia because these could be the signs of uh, an occult uh, cancer somewhere in the bowel or somewhere in the abdomen and uh, you should not be missing on that one. And as I said earlier that normally we don't do abdominal x-rays uh, for uh, constipation because essentially it's a clinical diagnosis but nevertheless uh, clinically sometimes a kid come uh, with a history of acute abdominal pain uh, which has worsened over the last uh, 24 to 48 hours there's no clear-cut history of constipation because the child has been passing stools almost every other day so the thing as we said earlier that sometimes it's incomplete uh, defecation so the child is passing a little bit of stools but most of the stools are retained inside and that can lead to constipation and a time comes when they go into acute abdominal pain and they can present uh, just like an acute abdomen to the accidents in emergency department and in that and in that sort of scenarios uh, we do an abdominal x-ray just to rule out air fluid levels because we want to rule out a surgical abdomen and usually what happens most of the times because surgical abdomen is a bit of rare thing in kids most of the times what we see is actually fecal uh, matter which goes more in favor of uh, constipation. And here I will show you a few x-rays. Now, if you look on the x-ray to the left side, you would see it's being marked with black circles as well. Uh, this child, uh, whole large intestine, whether it's the ascending colon or whether it's a descending colon as well as the rectosigmoid areas shows white fluffy patches, which are nothing but fecal. It, these are hard fecal matters so much hard that uh, they are blocking the uh, the x-rays and they show up as white uh, fluffy masses uh, on the abdominal x-ray so this is uh, constipation on the middle x-ray again you can see uh, some abdominal gas with whitish fluffy shadows again you can find uh, you can see those shadows in the whole of uh, ascending colon transverse colon descending colon as well as rectosigmoid uh, area so this child is completely bunged up so all of its large intestine is fully loaded with fecal matter and uh, the x-ray on the right side is of a neonate in this case you can see obviously the child has got abdominal distension you can see uh, the loops of distended small bowel and um, you can't find any uh, air shadow in the distal rectum and this is very important because if you do not find an air shadow in the distal rectum in a neonate uh, you should think of Hirschsprung disease so this neonate had actually Hirschsprung disease and because of that he had developed uh, um, abdominal obst obstruction intestinal obstruction and abdominal distension now we come down to the treatment uh, NICE, that is the National uh, Institute of Clinical Excellence uh, in UK, that has published guidelines for treatment of constipation in children. And uh, the NICE guidelines say that the first line of treatment in children for constipation should be oral macrogol, which comes under the name of Movicol. Now, Movicol comes uh, in uh, two uh, varieties. One is the adult Movicol and the other is the pediatric Movicol. And the pediatric Movicol is the one that we use for uh, first-line treatment of constipation. Now, we follow the uh, BNF and even the NICE has followed the BNF uh, doses for treatment of constipation. And the, 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 the dosages are actually separate for disinfection and separate for ongoing maintenance of constipation. So if a child comes with fecal impaction where the child is in acute abdominal pain, he hasn't passed stool, let's say for the last 48 to 72 hours, uh, he's in distress. In that case, you have to disimpact uh, him with oral macrogol uh, so that the, uh, the fecal obstruction is relieved and then you move on to the maintenance uh, dosing. Now, some people, uh, they talk about uh, giving them rectal enemas as well. Here in UK, the NICE recommends uh, 
uh, oral disinfection as a first line. You can only give uh, rectal enemas if the oral disinfection regimes have failed. So you start with oral disinfection, you give it a try. If that fails, then you move on to giving them rectal enemas as a second line treatment. So uh, the uh, again, the dosages of macrobol are uh, different for uh, different age groups. And again, they are different for disinfection and different for ongoing maintenance. So you give a higher dose for disinfection and uh, a lower doses are used for ongoing uh, maintenance. So normally uh, for uh, kids who are uh, age one to five years, if you think about disinfecting them, you have to give, you start with two sashes on day one. So first day you will give two sashes, one sashes dissolved in 60, 70 mils of water and uh, is given to the child. So you give them two sashes on day one, then you increase it to four sashes and these four sashes would be given for two days. So that on day two and day three, you would be giving them four sashes. Then on day uh, four and five, you would be giving them six sashes. And again, you would be giving them on day four and day five and then day on six and seven, you will give them eight sashes. Now, it's not necessary that you have definitely go up to eight sashes. So you start and you build it up till the child starts passing stool and uh, he should pass at least two to three soft stools per day. So if we, let's say if you are giving him four sashes, okay, on uh, day uh, two and three, okay, and he starts uh, passing stools, you would stop there and then you would go down to the uh, maintenance regime. But maximum of eight sashes can be given to a child uh, who is in the age uh, one year to five years bracket. For children uh, older than five years, uh, up to 12 years of age, you start with four sashes on uh, first day and then you add two sashes every day till you reach a maximum of 12 sashes. So you should not be going beyond 12 sashes. But again, where the child starts passing two to three soft stool per day, you will stop over there. And after that, you will go down to the uh, maintenance regime. And maintenance regimes are usually uh, half to one sachet for uh, children under one year of age for one to six it's usually two sachets per day and uh, from age six to twelve again uh, there are two sachets per day but you can go up to a maximum of four sachets uh, per day again uh, these sachets are usually given over a 12 uh, hour period so for example if a child is on four sachets per day mental regime you give two sachets in the morning and two sachets in the evening so you would go on to if, uh, if talking about disinfection, if the oral disinfection fails, then only then you will go towards uh, giving them rectal enemas and, uh, you know, uh, disinfecting them. NICE at the same time uh, says that if uh, oral macrogol is not successful in treating the constipation, then you have to add on stimulant drugs. And the stimulants that are used in UK are sodium picosulfate, uh, bisacudyl, which is known as Dalcolex and uh, Senna. Most of the time we use uh, sodium picosulfate and it comes in a syrup form for ch children up to four years of age. The dose is anywhere between 2.5 to 10 milligram once a day. You have to titrate the dose. Uh, it can be given once a day. Normally we give it twice or thrice a week uh, for a month. Uh, you can give bisacudyl. Again, bisacudyl can be given rectally or can be given by mouth. And Senna, Senna is also a very strong stim st stimulant uh, and uh, up to four years of age, it can be given anywhere between 2.5 to 10 milligram and 20, uh, uh, sorry, tw 20 mils, uh, which is equal to uh, 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 around uh, to, to 28 to 30 milligram that can be given uh, once daily to older uh, kids. But normally we give it for a week because they're very strong stimulant and we don't want uh, them to get used to uh, these things because sometimes it leads to tolerance and uh, the intestines are then dependent on senna uh, to have normal bowel movements. So the only one thing that uh, needs to be given on a long-term basis is uh, oral macrocol or movicol. So uh, in, in general, the treatment is whether you start with disinfection or whether you start with a normal maintenance regime, you have to give oral macrobol uh, for three to six months uh, because if you treat constipation for a duration less than that then the constipation would come back so it's very important that the intestines uh, they get used to increase mortality and uh, the child needs to be given this for at least three to six months so that if there are any habitual 
uh, factors responsible for constipation they are overcome uh, during these three to six months of age so remember the nice guidelines say that we start with the oral movicol and if the oral movicol fails for disimpaction we give them rectal enema but for maintenance if it fails then you have to add stimulants to oral movicol and the treatment should continue for three to six months so that uh, in a nutshell uh, was uh, constipation its etiology uh, diagnosis and treatment uh, i hope you have liked the lecture you've enjoyed the lecture if there are any questions or, or comments uh, just ask me in the comment section below uh, thank you very much